Hello, and welcome to the Community IT Innovators Technology Topics Podcast, where we discuss nonprofit technology, cybersecurity, tech project implementation, strategic planning, and nonprofit IT careers. Find us at communityit.com. Hello, and welcome to the July 2021 Community IT Innovators Webinar. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on preparing your laptops for takeoff. And today we're gonna to be discussing a set of tools that we've started using at Community IT to efficiently provision new laptops and reprovision existing laptops in a way that it's really helped to make the process more efficient. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that these new methods that we've started to use have saved our clients a lot of time and money and have made the provisioning process a lot easier and a lot smoother. My name is Johan Hammerstrom. I'm the CEO of Community IT and the moderator for this webinar series. The slides and recording for today's webinar will be available on our website and YouTube channel later this week. If you're watching the recording on YouTube right now, please consider subscribing to our channel to continue to receive automatic updates when we post new webinar recordings. You can use the chat feature provided by Zoom throughout the webinar today to ask questions, and we'll do our best to answer those questions as they come in. Before we begin, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about our company in case you're not familiar with Community IT. We're a 100% employee-owned company, and our team of almost 40 staff is dedicated to helping nonprofit organizations advance their missions through the effective use of technology. We're technology experts, and we've been consistently named a top 501 managed services provider by Channel Futures. And I'm happy to report that we received that honor again, just found out for 2021. So it's my pleasure now to welcome my co-presenters, Steve and Phil, if you could each uh, introduce yourselves. I'll go first. Um, I'm Steve Longenecker. I'm the director of IT consulting at Community IT. I've been at Community IT for, I, I started a month after my son was born and he is turning 17 in August. So almost 17 years. Um, it's been a great uh, joy to work at Community IT and to help nonprofits uh, with their um, IT decisions and IT implementations. And I am Phil Oswald Pristano. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at Community IT, um, mostly in uh, working with uh, various projects uh, and handling escalations from uh, my colleagues. Uh, I have been with Community IT um, for quite a while. I joined the company in January 2000, so that's easy to remember from how many years <laughs> I've been with the company. And uh, it's been such a pleasure working with uh, various nonprofit organizations in the DC metro area and throughout the US. Great, thank you both. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you here on the webinar today. And I'm really looking forward to today's webinar. Um, it's a topic that I think we're all excited about, um, which, you know, we're IT people, so we get excited about IT issues. But this is something that I think has been you know, uh, pretty transformational for the work that we do. And we're, we're excited to talk to you all about it today. Um, and we're gonna dive right into it. We have a lot to cover. So we're gonna, we're gonna start right away. Um, so the, the problem really that uh, this new technology seeks to solve has to do with what we call the endpoint reality. And as much as, you know, information like email and files have moved into the cloud, at the end of the day, in order for nonprofit professionals to be effective, they still have an endpoint. They still have a, a computer. Um, increasingly, that computer is a laptop, and that laptop needs to be set up. When you hire new staff, they need to get a laptop that's ready for them to use. Um, when you replace laptops, uh, you need to provision the new hardware for existing staff. When staff leave, their laptops need to be reprovisioned um, for their replacements. So all of that creates a provisioning headache. And one of the big um, you know, uses of time, one of the ways that we spend a lot of our time providing IT support is in provisioning laptops. And um, traditionally, there have been three different ways of, of doing that. And the first way is imaging. 
And it, with imaging, you, you basically get one laptop set up or desktop set up the way that you want it to be set up. And you, you take sort of a snapshot of, of that laptop and then you copy that snapshot onto other machines. So that in theory, they're set up exactly the same way as what's called the image machine. So that's imaging. The second approach is scripted deployment. And that's where you have a server um, that you're pulling files and software from. And you basically have a, you write a script to sort of automate the process of setting up a new machine. And the third option is just manual install. You have a, a physical checklist, a printed out checklist oftentimes of all the steps that you have to go through when setting up a new laptop. Um, you know, removing bloatware, tweaking the settings, installing the right software, getting it configured for the organization's staff. Um, that, so that's the third method. This is pretty much the three main methods that we've had over the years for provisioning hardware. And each one of them, um, you know, has its, has its shortcomings. Uh, so I was wondering, um, Phil, if you could talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the shortcomings? Let's start with imaging. Phil and then Steve, if you could just talk a little bit about why, you know, the fact that there are three methods means none of them work very well uh, or ideally. So what are some of the challenges with imaging? Yes, uh, so with imaging, um, first of all, like what Johan was saying earlier, it's based on a particular image. Uh, and of course, in most organizations, we are working with multiple models of laptops and desktops. Uh, so in the traditional imaging, you know, you have to deal with drivers, for example. So each of the hardware model would uh, oftentimes would have different uh, drivers that's required, whether that's for, uh, for the video card or the network card or audio card. And, you know, if there's a mismatch, sometimes it can, you know, cost the famous uh, blue screen of death or the purple screen of death, uh, you name it. And so oftentimes um, uh, you have to take that into consideration. And if it's possible to, you know, preload the, the, the different variation into a single image so that uh, the computer will be smart enough to pick whatever is needed. But on top of that, there's the, the application itself. Um, you know, Microsoft Office would, uh, would change version and then you have to update the image again. Uh, Windows updates, uh, of course, continuously, uh, the, the new one, you know, come up and then you have to, you have to do that. Otherwise, when you run the image and you provision a new computer, then you still have to run Windows updates on top of that. Uh, so that's a, that's a big hassle. Um, so the, 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 the biggest thing really is the updates. But then of course, in order to deploy the image, you need the physical access to the computer. Uh, and oftentimes when it is, um, uh, when it's done, through the, the through the network, uh, if it's not handled carefully, it can slow down the network, um, and then suddenly everybody complain about you know access to files and, and access to the internet. So that um, that is another issue uh, aside from just the fact that you have to be physically there, uh, physically available, uh, you know, be, be with the hardware itself. This method works great when you're deploying hundreds and hundreds of laptops at once because you, it's really efficient at that scale. You, you create the image on the hardware. All presumably, when you're doing hundreds of laptops at once, you, they're all of the laptops are ordered at once. They're all the same hardware profile. So you need one set of drivers. You get that image just right, and then you can blast it out really quickly. Um, you know, if you get all, if you have hundreds of laptops, you can, we, I remember days we'd have like, you know, we would never do it with hundreds and hundreds. We didn't have clients that big, but we could have a, a room with 30 laptops all being imaged at once off of a, off of a switch and, and, you know, from a, from a network. Uh, so this is not a bad way to go. Um, when you're, when you're operating at that kind of scale, rarely are our clients operating at that kind of scale. 
And so if you're buying three laptops at a time, you buy the three laptops, you might have an image for it. And then, you know, the next time you buy laptops, six months later, three more, you know, Dell has updated that hardware. It's the same model number, but it turns out that it's a different network card in there or a different, you know, um, video uh, or just the drivers have updated and so on. So that's kind of the, the trade-offs that we're making with imaging. And also, uh, you know, uh, I remember the time when we avoid using the network for uh, image deployment by actually putting the image in USB drives. But those are its own hassle because every time you update an image, you have to update all the USB drives. And then there's a certain uh, percentage of failure. You plug in the USB drive and it's not working. So then you have to find a different one. Um, and you know you still have to have somebody physically plugging it in for each one of them. Yeah, it ended up uh, taking more time than it saved. And I don't know what the, the magic number was in, in terms of how many computers you'd have to be buying in order to actually save time. Uh, but I do think it was in the, the dozens, if not closer to the hundreds that um, Steve referenced. Yeah, in my previous life, I was a teacher and I, and I know that at, t at school, you know, like at Montgomery County, I worked for Montgomery County schools for a while. And, you know, there they have, you know, there's like, I don't know how many thousands of students there are in, across, the, across the county, but they have lots and lots of computers. And it made sense that every summer they'd make a new image. They, they had like, they had their set models of, these were back in the day when it was all Apple products, but you know, their set models of Macs. And that was something that they did in the summer. They just sent staff from the IT department out to different schools with this image and they would image all the computers. And it was nice, you know, it refreshed everything. And you can, you can use it to not just deploy new computers, but to, re, to sort of make old computers uh, all the same again. Um, but again, it takes scale for this to be efficient. Yeah, not a bad solution, but not always a great fit. And uh, I think that led a lot of us into going with the scripted deployment method. Um, but that method had its own uh, shortcomings. Do you want to say a little bit more about those, Steve? Sure. So scripted deployment, the imaging is the idea that you have like an image that fits a particular hardware profile. A scripted deployment is basically not doing that. It's more or less doing what you do manually. You know, when you manually turn a computer, you turn it on, you run Windows updates, you might update some drivers, you might install some software, you do all these things manually. A scripted deployment basically gets all of the media that you need into a certain in, into either a server um, or onto a USB stick, like Phil was mentioning before. And then a, a script runs and the script calls these things in order and says, okay, first do this, then do that, then do this, then do that. And it's very nice that you can, you know, plug in a USB key to a, a, a laptop, um, go through a, a short uh, sort of wizard, if you like, that that says things like what you want to name the computer and uh, you know, a couple other like things is you know, what some other like what kind of office are we going to install? It's going to be Office 2016, it's going to be Office 2019, and all those, all those different options are in the are in the uh, scripted stuff and the scripted resources, the script resources that are on that USB. And then you let the thing, you can walk away and you can come back, you know, an hour and a half later, and it's all just so because it's all been mapped out with the script. It still needs regular refreshing refreshing. The drivers that are on that USB stick, and you can do again. You can use it on a server, but you know you get a new model of computer from Lenovo or from Dell, and now you need you know new drivers um, added to your sort of set of resources that your scripts are using. And uh, if you, uh, if uh, Phil mentioned, you know Office releases releasing new software, well that needs to be accounted for, and so so that all of those things still apply. Um, it is a little bit more um, flexible than the imaging solution because you are basically leveraging uh, the the, um, the flexibility of like software installation. You know, software is designed to run on lots of different models. So you just, since you're basically scripting an installation, instead of like installing an image of the software that has to only work with this hard, hardware profile, you are scripting installation of software and that software installation, you know, recognizes what kind of hardware you're dealing with. So it's a lot more flexible, but it still needs a regular refreshing. And we still need to plug either the USB drive into the computer to run it, or you need, the computer needs to be turned on in the office where the, where the server that does this um, is located. Uh, it, do, it still requires um, physical access to the computer by the 
on the part of the um, technician. Yes, and it is definitely a better solution compared to imaging, Strata imaging, because uh, it's modular, um, but there's still the same limitation uh, in a sense as far as you know physical access. And, uh, and, and these weren't necessarily viewed as limitations, I don't think either, um, until you know really the pandemic really made those limitations really evident. Um, yeah. And then the, you know, the, the, the old fashioned. Fighting food, that's right. Yeah, manual, if, if all else fails, uh, you know, give the computer to your IT department and have well, them. Really, it's not when all else fails, it's when you don't have any kind of scale at all. So yeah. imaging and scripted deployment just require, so it's a perfectly, it's the only option that we had when we're dealing with clients that had, you know, you know, one computer a year, three computers a year, where there wasn't wasn't worth setting those things up. We did sort of have a scripted deployment for a generic image that we would use a community IT across our clients. So that's not true. But um, but even when you did a scripted deployment, there was still always manual processes at the end that that sort of um, made the computer uh, um, custom to the client that the that. That the computer belonged to. So we had a generic scripted deployment that we would run on a computer. And then at the end, okay, well, we know this client needs this and they need this software and they have this special thing. And so we have to do all of that. So there's the checklist and there you go. And yeah, we have unreliable down there because we're human <laughs> beings. And even with a checklist, you know, people make mistakes. Um, and that is, um, you know, the a limitation of doing things manually. We did, by the way, I, uh, I, I edited this slide. So I, it says requires physical access or screen sharing. So we started doing this shortly after the pandemic began before we really got into the, the autopilot and Intune stuff that we're gonna talk about later. And so we were doing this sort of manual install approach um, when you know, clients were saying, you know, can we make this more efficient? Can we just ship this computer directly to you know so and so? They're in Kansas for God's sakes because they've gone home because there's no one at the office and they've gone home to you know whatever live with the you know their family or whatever and and so we would ship stuff to them. But then we're to sort of on the phone with them, talking them through the initial setup, and then we have to screen share with them as soon as we can, as soon as we have a, the ability to do that, and then we're sort of doing it with them remotely. So we're not necessarily physically on the computer, but we're still in a sense, uh, needing to be sort of uh, mediating the experience um, through a screen sharing type thing. Yeah, and it just adds inefficiencies and it's, you know, even with the friendliest, most efficient IT department, it still creates frustrations and, and, and challenges. If there were no better way, we would yeah. live with it. Um, so, you know, in summary, this whole question of provisioning is something that it's, it's been a perennial challenge for IT. Um, as, as Steve referenced, it's been made worse by the pandemic uh, with people working from home, um, with, with nonprofit staff working both uh, in a remote capacity as well as dispersed. You know, it's not just that people are working remotely, but they're working from a wide variety of locations. Um, I think a lot of organizations are starting to bring on staff from other parts of the, of the country. And you know, as, as was clear from sort of the, the challenges of the traditional provisioning methods, just exacerbates, you know, some of those challenges. So there is a new endpoint reality that, that we're happy to share with you today, and it, it's um, being delivered by a new solution. And that new solution is basically cloud-managed deployment. And um, bear with us a little bit. Uh, and this, actually, you know, one of the, the misconceptions or misnomers is that this is Microsoft Autopilot. And I was probably one of the last people uh, at Community IT to really understand how all this worked. And I thought, oh, it's all Autopilot. Like, just use Autopilot. Um, actually, it's a little more complicated than that. The logic of it makes sense once you understand it. And that's one of the things that we really want to explain today in this webinar. Uh, but Microsoft basically provides... Uh, integration between these three different uh, utilities or systems in Microsoft 365, Microsoft Autopilot, Microsoft Intune, and Azure Active Directory. And by using these three systems together in a very specific way, 
it, it allows IT departments to deploy um, laptops and provision them in a cloud managed way from a, from a centralized cloud managed location. So we're gonna go into more detail. Um, Steve, do you mind walking us through this diagram? Sure, so the, the, the idea here is that, I mean, first of all, this is kind of dependent on the fact that um, Microsoft is, you know, the hegemony that Microsoft wants to have over the world is impressive. And, and um, sometimes I think people view it as scary and maybe appropriately so, but it's also super duper convenient, particularly for nonprofits with, with which Microsoft has been exceedingly generous over the year in terms of their pricing. So everything here is provided by Microsoft and, and, and IT, we talk about the Microsoft stack and there are other stacks that other uh, large vendors might provide, but the Microsoft stack, it's important to think about these different layers and the fact that Microsoft is providing all of them um, makes for very, for them to have opportunities for integrations that just can't be beat. And in fact, one of the things that's not on this diagram, um, but it's not trivial at all, is the fact that the Windows operating system is also a Microsoft product and it's kind of depends, all of this depends on the fact that they've built these hooks into Windows 10. So this is something that came out sort of with Windows 10. Um, so with Windows 10, Microsoft has made it possible for uh, this program called Autopilot in which um, manufacturers actually, be, you know, as part of sort of specking and building the machine, they get what's called a hardware hash from the particular laptop. And, and this can be done with desktops as well, but we really focus on laptops uh, in this presentation because that's really uh, the, the form factor that this really makes the most sense for, but it, it works fine with desktops. But a, uh, a laptop has a hardware hash. It's depending on a lot of different things. And if you actually, I think, Phil, you, you're the engineer here, but I, I believe that if you might, if you make a radical change to a laptop, replacing the motherboard certainly, but even some of the other hardware potentially, um, that hash might change, but the hash, is unique to that machine. And so uh, Dell is the vendor we work with the most, but you know, all, the, all the big players, Lenovo, you know, um, HP, they would all be part of this program. Um, you need to uh, basically make, let's just use Dell as our example. You need to make Dell your partner. And, um, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing from the next slide, but, but Dell basically says, all right, this laptop is tied to this Azure Active Directory. And, it's, and they do that before they even ship the laptop, sort of part of the shipping process. Um, so then that enrolls the hardware in your Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory then is sort of the place where, that, um, where all the user accounts and, um, and computer accounts are sort of kept track of. And part of Azure Active Directory, Azure Active Directory is part of Microsoft 365, Microsoft 365. So again, we're part of that stack. And Microsoft 365 has added to their Azure suite of services or their 365 suite of services, depending on, on uh, sort of which frame of reference you want to use, uh, a device management um, uh, uh, platform. And this device management platform uh, doesn't just, doesn't have to only manage Windows devices. It actually, they, they, they wanted to be able to manage, you know, iOS and Android devices as well but it's obviously very good at managing Windows devices. And so Autopilot enrolls you in Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory then says, you are part of this group of policies um, and you should get this device, these, these policies should be applied to your device. And just a quick uh, you know, addition, yep. the policies really are uh, managed by Intune. Uh, right. so That's the name of the, the, of the platform that, that is the actual set of policies. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. And the policies are, there are no policies in a, in a, in a fresh uh, 365 tenant. I mean, the policies are, are created. There's a, there's a bunch of policies that are sort of generic that you can, that you can add yourself. Um, you know, Microsoft has a bunch of, of uh, templates but there, there are none to start with. And, and so someone has to add those policies. That's, that would be the role of community IT for our clients. And we'll, we'll get into that. We're gonna go into each one of these in a lot more detail. So we'll, we'll talk in a few minutes about policies that we recommend, you know, what we recommend configuring, the kinds of things you can do uh, with Intune policies. Um, but I think the place to start is with Azure Active Directory. So just to clarify a little bit more, because that's sort of the centerpiece of this whole 
system is the Azure Active Directory. So having a, a better understanding of what that is and how it works is really important to understanding this whole provisioning method. Um, so Azure Active Directory is, is the cloud-based version of uh, Microsoft's Active Directory, which is basically a, a system that runs on servers. So for many years, most uh, small, medium, large organizations had a server in their office. Uh, those of you who are in IT would know it as a domain controller. Uh, you may have heard that term or DC. And that server um, hosts the Active Directory, which is basically a list of all the users uh, user accounts and all the computers. And it's the thing that you authenticate against when you log into your laptop. So back in the old days, you had a desktop, you'd come into the office, you'd put in your username and password. It would verify your username and password with the Active Directory. And if it matched, you're able to log into your computer. At that point, you were logging on to what was known as the domain. And once you were logged into the domain, you could get to your mailbox, on a Microsoft Exchange server, you could get to files that you had access to on your file server. You could print things to printers that you had access to. So the on-premise Active Directory was really that record of, of identity that gave you access to different resources. Azure Active Directory is the version of that that lives in the cloud. So for those of you who have Office 365 for your email, you're logging into Outlook, either on the web or you're connecting to Office 365 from your desktop Outlook, the username and password that you type in to connect to those resources is stored in the Azure Active Directory. So it's a cloud hosted directory um, used for Office 365. And one of the things that has been added recently, I don't know, maybe it's not recently, but um, you know, we've been using more and more is, is adding device identities um, as well as user account identities. Did you, you want to say a little more about that, Steve? Sorry, I was distracted by a question from uh, Vertigia. Um, so I missed some of what you said. Um, so I No, will... it's fine. No, okay. no, um, no, anything else to add in terms of Azure, uh, Azure Active Directory? Phil, feel free to. Yeah, in, in, the, in the same manner that you know, Azure, Azure Active Directory is paired with Intune to handle policies the local Active Directory actually has policies also that uh, often are used, whether that's to map drives or map printers, uh, deploy software and you know, set different restrictions. Uh, you know, it, at, uh, the local Active Directory is, has those kind of policy capability also. Uh, and, and is a little more mature, we'd have to admit. I mean, it's been around forever, not forever, it's been around since the 90s, certainly. Um, uh, but, you know, the, yeah, Microsoft can, can basically take all of their knowledge about Active Directory, the local version, and, a, and quickly reverse engineer it into Azure Active Directory. So the level, of, the level of maturity that Azure Active Directory is at now, considering its relative age, it's, you know, it's far, far, far further along than, than Active Directory was at a similar age because Microsoft has has so much knowledge from the from the on-premise experience and basically can just port whole whole swaths of, of control points right over into the cloud you know the cloud version. They're not the same. It's, we there, we have plenty of clients that have Active Directory in their on-premise domain, and they have Azure Active Directory because they're Microsoft 365 customers. And Azure Active Directory is where your credentials for logging into your, you know, your email, Microsoft 365 email or your Microsoft 365 SharePoint, all that's hosted. Those two things can be very easily, uh, Microsoft, want, again, has integrations between their different parts of their stack, can be very easily synced. They can actually be more than synced, but in all, in, in all of the cases of our clients and probably anybody on this webinar, uh, to, to not have them be, to have them be synced is reasonable to have them actually be the same database takes a level of scale that uh, you, know, you need you know, at least tens of thousands of seats and multiple, you, because at that point, um, yeah, you need to have a lot of uh, uh, um, failover and, and so on, to, to, or you risk uh, downtime if, if any server fails. But directory synchronization 
happens. But, but be aware those are actually different directories. They're just being synced. So I have a, a username and, an, and, a, and a password, and I have a, a, a matching username and password. Uh, I have one in, in Active Directory. I have another one in Azure Active Directory. They're the same username. They're the same password. But they're actually different accounts in different databases. And it's just that those databases talk to each other because Microsoft has built that integration um, for us. So if you if you're listening today and you have um, and your email is in Office 365, you have an account in Azure Active Absolutely. Directory with uh, what's known as your tenant. That's your organization's tenant. Um, and is it fair to say that Microsoft is really that Azure Active Directory is really kind of the way of the future for Microsoft, and they're um, you know they're they're building all of these things you know, around Act, Azure, Act, Azure Active Directory? I'd say so, yeah. I think it's gonna take a long time for the really, really big players to completely, to, to move away from, from Active Directory entirely, but um, because they have, you know, such huge on-premise infrastructures. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that's the future, yes. Um, I just think it's getting, you know, it's, ha it's happening. It's just too, it's, Microsoft's making it too, too much. They're getting better and better at making it easy. And, and as far as our clients, which is at a much smaller scale, you know, we, we are, you know, I have on my list to write a blog post about, you know, the serverless office, because we used to say, you know, you'd go serverless if you had five or less seats. And, you know, now, you know, we're advising our, some of our clients that have you know, a hundred seats. So yeah, you should still go serverless. I mean, you can't just turn off the servers. You have to like work your way to that point. But the cloud, the fact that, you know, Microsoft really has an impressive uh, uh, points of integration between all of these uh, local devices and the cloud is makes it possible. So I think the key concept, uh, if, if there's one takeaway at all from this webinar today, for me at least, it's that um, not only do your staff have an identity, if you will, in Azure Active Directory through their user account, but now your hardware has an identity as well. You, you have a record of all of your user accounts as an organization in Azure Active Directory. And you can also have, a, you can add all of your um, Windows devices. That's an important note. And there's a question about Macs that we'll come back to at the end of the webinar in the Q&A section. Um, all your Windows devices can be added to Azure Active Directory as well. Um, so that leads us into Microsoft Autopilot. So we talked a little bit about it earlier. Let's go into some more depth. Um, Phil, could you tell us a little bit more about what Microsoft Autopilot is? Sure, yeah. So again, like what Steve was uh, saying previously, uh, with Autopilot, uh, Microsoft gives the ability for hardware vendors to essentially marry the hardware and the tenant. Uh, as Johan mentioned earlier, when you have uh, Active, uh, Azure Active Directory, uh, that is located in, in the Microsoft tenant, uh, which is identified by you know, the organization for, for the organization uh, identity. Uh, so with this uh, binding between the hardware and the Microsoft tenant, uh, what it does is for one thing, it creates uh, a layer of security because uh, at this point, if a hardware is purchased with autopilot enabled and the vendor, be it Dell, Lenovo, or HP, already add the, uh, uh, hardware hash into autopilot um, in order for uh, a person to use that computer uh, that person will have to actually use the organization uh, credential username and password that belong to the organization so for example if a organization do this whole setup and I somehow get hold of the laptop and log in using community ID credential or my personal credential, uh, it will not let me do that. Um, so that's that's one you know one one thing about autopilot. But also uh, once you set up autopilot uh, correctly, uh, the first time uh, a user open 
a laptop. And this doesn't have to be, you know, like a, an IT person. It could be just anyone in the organization. Uh, after connecting it to the internet, which is part of the usual, you know, um, uh, out of the box experience. Once you connect it to the internet and you log in using the organizational credential, it will automatically uh, join the the hardware into Azure Active Directory. Now this is uh, analogous to what Steve was saying earlier and, and Johan, how uh, a computer in your organization traditionally on-premise are joined to the domain of the organization on-premise. So in the same way, these computers would be joined to the Azure Active Directory. Um, and with that also, again, if, if, if it's configured correctly, um, the device will automatically enroll into Intune. Uh, so again, uh, the on-prem uh, Active Directory, Azure Active Directory, group policy on-prem, Intune. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they, they, they all go hand in hand. Um, of course, there are requirements as like license that need to be uh, met and uh, making sure that all the assignments in, in terms of security groups need to be done properly before this can happen. Uh, but again, going back to the flow of things, you know, once when somebody log in, the computer is joined to Azure Active Directory, enrolled into Intune, um, and from, from there, it's all about Intune doing the rest of the work, uh, applying, policy or software, or whatever we want to uh, set up. So another scenario that comes to mind is um, oftentimes organizations will uh, donate or even sell old computers to staff to use as their own personal laptop. And uh, if, if any organizations are doing that, they need to explicitly go in and remove the autopilot association because basically once a laptop is enrolled in in autopilot when you you can reset it you can do the windows reset the very first screens you come to once you connect to the internet require you to log in with an organization um, user account and if you know and it and then you're off to the races with the laptop basically being joined to the organization's active directory you, you once it's enrolled in autopilot you simply cannot set the laptop up uh, to any other organization or to a personal account. Is that is that accurate? I don't. I want. I'm curious. Just I'm thinking out loud. You know that the bit about the hardware hash. Like maybe if you swapped out some fundamental piece of hardware, you would you would screw with that membership. So I'm not. Say, we're not suggesting that it's, but um, it's impossible to sort of work your way around it. But um, that laptop, as it is configured from the from the manufacturer is associated with your tenant the out of the box experience that there's actually it's like you know you can google it's like obbe or something like that like there's an acronym for everything in it but o the a, obe the out of the box experience that the user ex, that the user goes through anybody that's set up a new laptop it'll look it looks very it looks like it's the same basically it's like you know are you is English the language you want? You know, is, there, is this a US keyboard? Do you want to connect to the internet? You know, choose your wireless network. Up until that point, basically, and at that point, instead of saying, you know, log in with a Microsoft with you know, you want log in with a Microsoft ID or your work school account. Very generic. It says, you know, log in with your community IT account because it's autopilot bound to community IT using community IT as the as the organization example in that. Uh, it's 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 great, and it's great that you can basically um, ship it directly to you know so, at someone's house. Tell them to turn it on and just walk through a pretty straight. We have a little guide that we provide as a as a link to, in our documentation, but you know you really almost don't need that. It just it just uh, runs. Yep. Oh. Uh, Johan, you're muted, but I, I, I do want to add one thing. <laughs> With autopilot also, uh, one, one nice feature is, let's say, you know, uh, a person in, in the organization that is using a laptop that has been configured through autopilot, 
uh, leave the organization and then you want to reassign this uh, laptop to another user, uh, there is a, a nice feature with Autopilot called Autopilot Reset where you can just do that from, from the uh, you know, Azure Active Directory uh, console or Intune console. Um, and as far as you know, the computer is connected to the internet somewhere, it will, it will do the reset on its own and the next person can use it you know, fresh uh, uh, through the out of the box experience again without, without you having to do much work really. Uh, typically when, when we reassign laptop to a user, either we have to uh, re-image or at least clean up the, the current Windows profile before, before uh, reassigning it. Or if we don't, even though it's working, uh, you run into a risk of you know, running out of hard drive space because there's all this uh, files that, uh, that's just filling up the hard drive. Yeah, thank you, Phil. That's a great point. Um, I I, I should yeah no it's real quick but I should clarify too that this that that the idea of okay we do want to give this five year old laptop to a staff person to take home for their personal use it's not like unenrolling it from from autopilot is difficult all of this is done through the admin portal which is a web based portal that you know you connect it's basically the Microsoft three sixty five admin portal and it's a you know these are just clicks very 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 fast stuff that you can do Re resetting it uh, to like autopilot reset couple clicks, it takes the laptop longer to do that, but um, it doesn't take it that long. Um, and similarly, re removing it from, from autopilot so that someone can take it home um, and not have to be bound to your tenant is also just a couple clicks. Yeah, and, and you can enroll existing hardware. Uh, you know, obviously one of the great things is you, you buy five new laptops um, from Dell, let's say, and, and one's going to Kansas and one's going to California, and, and one's going to North Carolina. Um, if they're enrolled in autopilot, they basically show up ready to be logged into the organization's domain. If you have a staff person who's leaving, um, you can, on their last day, have them connect to the internet and run the autopilot reset, and they can ship the laptop directly to somebody else in the organization, or they can ship it back to the main office. Um, so there's a lot of flexibility in terms of you know, doing all of this remotely and, and really automatically. Um, so that all sounds great. But of course, once you log in with the uh, laptop account, there you have your fresh installation of Windows. Um, there's a piece missing and that's configuring the laptop with all of the settings and the software and everything. And that's all done through Microsoft Intune. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Microsoft Intune. Uh, what it is and how it works. Um, Bill, do you want to, or Steve, do sure. you want to go first? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's probably, this is probably Phil's bailiwick. I mean, he's the That's one who I does thought, the, yeah. actual, the actual engineering of this. Um, so I don't know whether you want a longer answer or a shorter one. But well, you, Phil, you were Phil off can... mute, so I thought maybe you had. You had no, a... no, go ahead. Okay, go. Phil, take it away. Yeah, so uh, one, one thing I, I, I do want to add with autopilot uh, from the previous slide, uh, one thing we can do as part of the autopilot enrollment is uh, set it up so that when that user log in, you uh, can set up the, the computer name, the host name. Uh, that way it's all uniform. Typically we do like a, an abbreviation of the, uh, the organization name dash uh, the tag number or the serial number. Uh, that way, you know, it's not complete random uh, name that Microsoft assigned, which is usually desktop and then it's a random name. And the other thing is you can set, uh, set it up so that the user will either have a local administrative privilege or just a standard user without local admin privilege. Now, uh, jumping into Intune here, again, as I mentioned earlier, Intune is almost analogous to the group policy uh, for the uh, on-premise on, on domain. So with, with that, uh, you can create uh, various uh, policies. For example, like uh, as, as a standard deployment, we, we set up uh, this uh, encryption uh, standard. Uh, and then, you know, uh, 
have we installed uh, various uh, standard applications uh, and we can uh, we can run uh, various uh, uh, PowerShell scripts um, and again what's what, what's really nice about this is you manage it in the cloud and as far as there's internet connectivity those changes will be applied automatically uh, so um, yeah it's it's a uh, so in terms of uh, experience from, from the user, once once they log in and went through all this whole enrollment, uh, Intune will just take over and to start installing application and applying policies without any uh, user interaction. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so that really, really minimize, uh, minimize the work from uh, IT staff uh, and it, you know, minimize uh, uh, work from from the users and also. And and in your experience, Phil, it's possible to pretty much do everything you need to do from a configuration standpoint. And we'll we'll have some examples in I think two slides from now. But um, it it really and I think one of the other great things about Intune is that it's a living. Like it, it's a it's being applied to all of the um, Azure AD joined hardware. So, so let's say um, you know you're rolling out a new software, like you're you're rolling out a new desktop software um, that everyone in the organization needs. You, you would just add that up. You would add that into the Intune policy for the entire organization. It would get rolled out in you know in real time, so to speak, for. But you don't have to remember to now add it to a checklist or to add it to your scripted deployment because basically, if it's if the, if autopilot is pulling from Intune, it's pulling the latest configuration as it's constantly being updated for the org. Correct, and and I just saw a, a question uh, flashing earlier whether uh, Microsoft software are the only ones that can be deployed for Intune. Uh, the answer is we can we can deploy most software some are not as friendly uh, with intune so to, to pick on the adobe for example with, when you have uh, adobe pro uh, these days the way it works is when you run the installer you actually have to log in as the user you know uh, to grab the license or well, we obviously can't automate logging in as the user with their credential um, so for for that type of software, we, we can't we can't uh, automate that. Uh, we we have found some some workaround which will involve you know the user doing more work, but um, but some you know some some tasks you just can't automate. My sense is that it's kind of early days with Intune, and that Microsoft is going to continue to develop the platform and mm -hmm. some of those. Um, issues that we've run into will hopefully get resolved over time. Um, some of the questions we've had are about, and someone actually, one of the one of the questions put it really well, like, well, this is Microsoft, so what is all this going to cost? Like, what licenses? And because it's my, and thank you to the person who asked that question, and because it's Microsoft, it's not a simple answer either. Anyone who's dealt with uh, Microsoft 365 licensing knows that it's a it's kind of an endless journey um but steve i was hoping you could uh walk us through uh this table so basically uh it using intune and and all the automated installation and features that phil's talking about does require you to have an intune license and that can be purchased in a variety of different ways correct thank you for that uh accurate um uh, introduction yeah so uh what you're looking for is Intune. Autopilot is essentially just there. That it doesn't, it doesn't, but it also doesn't really have any policy uh, abilities. So you can do Autopilot with with no license, but then you don't really, uh, except for them being Azure AD joined, and you could get the naming uh, the, the naming uh, convention set up. But for to get the actual, you know, policy configurations that that really drives us forward as a real benefit. You need to have an Intune license and that's that what you're looking for. So that can be purchased by itself um, for $1.50 per user per month. 
there is something called Intune for device, which I think it, the, all we have to do is say about that right now is that it's really for like kiosk computers. It's not really appropriate for computers that are assigned to a particular person. So for most situations, Intune for device is not appropriate, but you can buy Microsoft Intune as a separate SKU if you look in the subscription list. In the, and th these, all of these prices, I should say, are uh, quoting nonprofit pricing. So we're assuming that you're a, five, a qualified 501c3 for these prices. There are, all of these things can be purchased at commercial rates, but then of course it's generally on the order of uh, you know, three to four times more expensive. The license bundle that we recommend sort of to, our, to our, the average client that doesn't have a lot of special needs is the Microsoft 365 Business Premium License because it includes uh, a subscription to the Office desktop suite. So Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and so forth. And of course, email and uh, SharePoint and OneDrive, the, the cloud services, and it includes Intune. Um, to say it includes Intune, it's not that it's there's not one to one. It's not like if you look at a chart that has every single thing that is in Intune. That it's not every check is checked. Uh, not every line has a check in the check mark in it. But on all the lines that matter to us and to our clients are checked. So. Buy the business premium one, you sort of get everything. And there are 10 free uh, to all qualified nonprofits. So, you know, particularly small nonprofits, you know, that are 25 people, you get 10 free, and then you're spending, you know, five times 15 for the remaining to get to your, you get up to your 25 headcount. Um, and that includes the Intune. Um, the, the Microsoft 365 Enterprise E3 or E5 should not be confused with, um, no, that's, those price points are not correct there. Um, so my Office 365 E3, which is 450 a month, does not include the Intune license. Microsoft 365 E3 is a different SKU that almost none of our clients uh, use, but it includes like a Windows license. Um, that's a lot more expensive, although I don't have, I'm sorry that, I'm, that, we're, that we fumbled this a little bit, but I would just ignore line, line two on this table and we'll clean it up before we, um, uh, publish the, the slide deck. You, a lot of our clients um, that have been with us for a long time have 50, I think it's 50, 50 enterprise and mobility security, enterprise mobility and security E3 licenses. That's because uh, up until about three years ago, Microsoft was making 50 free to nonprofits. They just, you could just sign up for 50 and you got 50 and that was that. Um, and so uh, clients that were with us at that time, a lot of them anyway, um, we didn't do it to every single one of our clients because we thought it was something that we could always do later. And then one day suddenly Microsoft turned that tap off and it was no longer available. But if you were one of those people that was lucky enough to buy, to buy, to uh, sign up for those 50 free licenses or 40 free licenses or however many you signed up for a max of 50, you were grandfathered in and those continue to be available to you. So I have a client that I work with a lot that has you know 50 enterprise mobility security bundles um, and they don't have to pay anything for those. If you buy them now, they're 220 a month. Um, those uh, include Intune and include some other features as well. Um, so the way we would do it probably is for a generic client, buy the business premium license, you get the office desktop suite, you get the email, SharePoint, OneDrive, all the, the sort of the cloud services, you get your Intune license and that pretty much covers um, most of the things that you need, you get the conditional access for multi-factor authentication. You get, a, you get pretty much what we think uh, a typical uh, nonprofit would need. Um, if you're already tied, sort of tied into E3 licensing and you really um, want to stick with that, um, there are some things in E3 that aren't included in business premium. Um, then you could add the enterprise mobility and security suite for 220 a month, and you get a, a nice uh, bundle of of, um, of things, including Intune. So, uh, and we just had a question that just came across here. Does Intune come with Microsoft Business Standard or just premium? Uh, I think it's just premium. Yeah, you need the premium license to get the Intune. I'm pretty sure of that. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, and I'm sorry for uh, grabbing the wrong price there. It's on the tricky because Microsoft <laughs> 365 and Office 365 the E3s th look the same, but I yeah. thought I finally had it. I, th <laughs> I thought I finally had Microsoft licensing clear and, and it's humbling. You know, you think you it finally got it figured out and then 
on a live webinar, you realize you still have more to learn. <laughs> so uh, let's also, um, yeah, also ahead, recently, go. well, not too long ago, Microsoft changed the name. Maybe. Changed the names. So that, yeah. They, yes, yeah, Michael Shelley just told, uh, okay. sent a, a private message to us. Microsoft doesn't have it figured out. And that's absolutely right. They're, the marketing people at Microsoft run amok all the time. Um, so we just try to keep up. Yeah, it's whatever it is. It's a great deal because at nonprofit pricing, this stuff is great. So we yes. shouldn't we shouldn't uh, give Microsoft too hard a time about this. No, and they eventually get to the right answer um, on most things. Uh, so we we are running low on time. We have about five minutes left in the webinar. We do want to talk briefly about some of the things that you can do with um, Intune. I, I think we've talked about this at length, so we so we don't need to go through this procurement slide. Uh, but what are some of our standard recommendations, Phil? Um, what do we recommend um, configuring Intune to do out of the box uh, when, when a new laptop is being set up? Yeah, and, and this, uh, this goes hand in hand with uh, planning, right? Uh, planning is always important. And I, I believe uh, there was a question uh, at some point in asking about you know, how much time to get all this will take. Uh, with with the proper planning, essentially with the standard applications and standard configurations such as what you see uh, in the screen right now, uh, you can get this up and running uh, within two to three hours, uh, including testing if you have the hardware ready to go uh, for testing. Uh, and so yeah, standard recommendation uh, these days, the blocker, uh, is a uh, standard recommendation. Uh, as you know, security is uh, becoming more and more important. Um, uh, naming convention for, for computer, uh, absolutely. Uh, if you work with community IT, we typically install our managing agent. Um, for some large uh, nonprofit organization, you might have your own management agent uh, that can be uh, pushed to install. Uh, any browser, Chrome, Firefox, um, OneDrive Sync. We usually set it up so that it automatically uh, log in, automatically sync to you know desktop, or, or my documents, and things like that. Um, uh, we typically set it up to install the Office desktop apps with a shared uh, uh, licensing. Um, now, Windows Hello is sort of an um, organizational preference. Some people like using Windows Hello, some don't. So we can actually enable or, uh, enable or disable Windows Hello. Um, yeah, those are uh, the most basic, but then we often also add, you know, like the basic utility software uh, based on uh, organizational preference, such as uh, Acrobat Reader or 7-Zip or uh, uh, Zoom, um, uh, DLC, things like that. There was a question about uh, how much time and I answered it in the chat thing. Um, you know, three to four hours for this basic thing here that kind of, kind of would do this, this, these standard recommendations would probably take Phil you know, three to four hours to set up and maybe an hour to test and confirm everything's working, but it's, it's very reasonable. We have had, um, you know, autopilot in tune, you know, set up uh, many projects take more on the lines of 25 to 30 to even 50 hours where, you know, there's a very, uh, very, a lot of very particular specific needs and requirements that are trying to be met. And uh, that's fine, and that's worked really well for those for those clients, and and that's great. I think it gives Phil a lot of uh, interesting work. Um, so I don't. So there's no complaint about that. My advice in general would be to to keep it simple and not to make it overly. And so so this is this is solving a big problem, which is that whole deployment thing. But there's not really anything wrong. I just answered another question to this effect. There's not really anything wrong with like having your generic general set of policies for all the computers in the organization, you know, that you have 20 seats and they all, everybody gets the same generic 20 things. But if you're going to, if you only want to apply, you know, install, you know, finance software on the finance department people, and that's only two computers, to me, it makes sense at that scale. Now it's different if you have 500 seats, but if you just have two finance people, to me, it makes more sense to just handle those two people manually afterwards. They get the computer, they turn it on, they log in, the Intune policies apply, you know, everything's 
perfect and they they have a generic computer and then they call our help desk um, and we help them set up the the finance software. So that's just a sort of a strategic way that I look at things. Although again, you know, we have you know we want very secure VPN and we want this applied in a certain way and you know and we and we need this and we need that and we want um, we want you when you open up your um, your browser, we want it to go to the, to the internet first, you know, all these things. The, the more that you add these things, the more it drives up sort of the baseline cost. But if you're going to be, if that, if that's something that's spread out over enough computers, you get, you get a return on investment on that. But if it's, if it's, again, if it's only for, you know, 10 computers, um, because you only have 10 seats, at some point you need to pump the brakes on that. I, I do want to uh, address one question, which is, uh, you know, like, can, can you deploy in loop? Uh, only to certain groups. The answer is yes, because uh, you can you can have the generic uh, configuration that deploys to all autopilot devices, but then you can have, for example, uh, you know, uh, executive uh, executive yes. team get these certain ones. Uh, it's it's all similar to group policy. It's all driven by groups, so you can get different user groups to yeah. to, to specify. So there's tremendous granular control. I guess what I was cautioning is strategically how much control you want to exercise and how much complexity you want to build into this depends on your scale. You know, it's just it's probably not worth the extra effort um, if you're talking about an exception that only applies to like one or two computers. But that's a that's a decision that you know you can you can think, make make on a, for an by for, by individual clients. So we are we're at time. We have one more slide that we can go through quickly. Um, and these are some of the lessons learned. Uh, you want to plan this out carefully. It's not something that you can just kind of whip up uh, quickly. It requires sort of careful planning. You want to take an organized, methodical approach to getting it set up. Um, as we had mentioned earlier, there are certain things that Intune does really well, and it's important to focus on those. There's certain things that Intune, like Adobe, has a difficulty handling, and it's probably best to find workarounds in those situations. It can take time for policies to deploy, so it's not going to be instantaneous. Uh, it can take up to a few hours or up to a day for Intune policies to roll out. And um, again, going back to the Adobe example, there is third-party support for software. It's kind of uneven at the moment. And so um, that's something that uh, requires uh, careful planning. Uh, there, there's a question um, about uninstalling application. Uh, the answer is yes. So the way, the way you install application, you typically define the uninstall command. So again, using, using uh, uh, policy assignment, you can actually say uninstall it for this person or this group of people. Um, so yes, there is, a, there is a way to do that. Great. All right, well, I'm sorry to kind of uh, abruptly end this. Oh boy. Well, we don't have time to go through this, unfortunately. Uh, that'll have to be for a future webinar. I think we might need a part two of this webinar. Here's the overview. All of these slides will be available after the webinar. If you have questions, if you wanna set up a call with us, to, to go into a deeper dive on Intune, how you could potentially use it at your organization. You can send an email to connect at communityit.com or you can uh, click on this link, um, which I will send out in the chat um, to schedule some time with us. We'd love to talk more about your specific situation. Uh, and next month, it, this will be somewhat of a part two of this topic. Uh, our webinar next month is going to be a, about beyond the office. So I know a lot of organizations are, are you know, planning a return to the office, but a lot of organizations are also considering a new way forward that involves less reliance on a central office. And that has big implications for IT. And in some ways, this whole webinar on autopilot is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot more to discuss. Steve alluded to some of that earlier um, with the serverless office. And there's some uh, specific issues related to autopilot in the Q&A today that we might work into next month's webinar. So we encourage you to, to sign up for next month's webinar. Um, I think it'll be a good companion uh, to what we've been discussing today. 
and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we love doing these webinars. Thank you for the great questions. And uh, anyone who, whose question we didn't get a chance to answer um, today, we'll do our best to, to follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, Steve, Phil, any, any closing thoughts? It's been really fun talking about this. I wish we had had you know more time to waste from our audience members because I love <laughs> talking about this stuff and it's really interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and it has really worked well for uh, many of our clients that have utilized uh, autopilot and Intune, uh, even internationally, you know, both uh, clients having devices sent uh, to Europe or uh, other part of the countries, I mean, the, the world, and it is, it is working well. Great. Yeah, if you're interested in a part two of this webinar, we weren't sure, you know, how much interest there would be in this topic, but if you'd like a part two or a deeper dive on some specific uh, subtopics that came up for you today, go ahead and send that email to connect at communityit.com and we'd be happy to put together an autopilot part two uh, webinar um, later this year. All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope you all have a great afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us today. Community IT does these free webinars and podcasts for our community and we love sharing our knowledge and experience. If you have more questions or are having trouble with your IT at your nonprofit, please get in touch with us on our website, www.communityit.com, so we can start a conversation or schedule an assessment. Downloading any of our free resources there will get you signed up for our webinar reminders, and you can attend our next webinar in real time and ask our experts your own questions. If you love podcasts, Please subscribe and leave us a rating to help others find this leadership resource for nonprofits.